There's really not a ton of difference between a deep meditative trance, somebody having a mystical, quote unquote, mystical experience, somebody in a flow state, somebody having a psychedelic experience. Very similar things are happening in the brain. The right. knobs and levers being tweaked and tuned, tremendous overlap. What does it take to do the impossible? What does it, what does it take? to level up your game like never before. What does it take for individuals, for organizations, for even institutions to achieve paradigm shifting? Nothing is ever the same again, breakthroughs. Our mission is to decode the neurobiology of flow and cognitive peak performance. Access the minds of maverick scientists, groundbreaking innovators, and world leading experts to understand what it takes to achieve ultimate human performance. So you can feel your best, perform your best, and accomplish your boldest goals. I'm your host, Rian Doris, and together with best selling author Stephen Kotler, I present to you Flow Research Collective Radio. Stephen Kotler is a New York Times bestselling author, an award-winning journalist. His latest book is titled Stealing Fire, How Silicon Valley, the Navy SEALs, Mavericks of, uh, Maverick scientists are revolutionizing the way that we live and work. You've got a wonderful, colorful background of research and knowledge uh, and lots of previous work on the flow being in a flow state and how to hack into that state rather than being there by chance. This new book, is that an evolution of this or is it, is it sort of a hand in hand? What is it? You, it is. You are absolutely correct. And it's not only is it the evolution, it's sort of, it's, it's co-written my partner, Jamie Wheel, who is one of the world's leading experts on human performance. Brilliant. Could never have done this without him. And it really starts sort of with our experience at the Flow Genome Project, Rise of Superman, my book about flow, comes yeah. out. And flow, you know, for those who listening who aren't familiar with it, flow is an optimal state of consciousness, a state yeah. where we feel our best and we perform our best. And more specifically, it's those moments, total absorption, we get so focused on the task at hand that everything else just vanishes. Right. Action awareness, smart, right, in all aspects of the performance, mental and physical, go through the roof. Over the course of, of writing, Rise of Superman, uh, and and talking about flow and, and going out into the world and, and working with corporate leaders and, and you know everybody Navy SEALs Google on and on didn't really matter where Jamie and I were. People would come up to us after our talks and they were like, "Wow, this flow stuff! It's it's really magical. It's really important. It's great. It's fantastic. It's kind of at the center of what I do, anyways." Thank you, but you know I also do these other things. You know we're all meditating on a regular basis, or we are brain hacking our brain into these high performance states with these Dave Asprey toolkit, or we're going to tantric sex retreats that reset our brain, or we're microdosing with psychedelics. We had whole teams of engineers admit to microdosing the psychedelics. Wow. Or, and it went on and on and on. And two, we did two things. The first thing that caught our attention is so there's an old term called techniques of ecstasy. It was coined by a historian named Marcia Lotti, and it refers to a whole bunch of different things from singing, dancing, chanting, medit all the things that drive shaman into kind of dervish. non -al non alternate alternate sense of, con of states of consciousness. So we started to realize that these people were sort of using modern technologies of ecstasy. It was a wider class, but two things were interesting. One was because of the work we had done on the Flow Genome Project, kind of decoding flow, the way we had done that, and it was sort of an open source research project idea, had given us something that we could, we call it the Flow Genome Matrix, but it's sort of given us a Rosetta Stone mm -hmm. uh, for non-ordinary states of consciousness. And we started to realize, so if you go back in history, you go back 100 years ago, the foundation of psychology, neuroscience, the late 18th century, there's a guy named William James. He's at Harvard. He's a philosopher. He's a psychologist, the godfather of cognitive, of you know, psychology in America. And he's looking at these alternate states of consciousness, flow, contemplative and meditative states, mystical experiences like out-of-body and near-death experiences, psychedelic experiences. He thinks they're all the same thing. And he, what he says is he says, look, I don't – whatever it is – these things alter consciousness and you can dismiss everything, but on the other side, people are very different. 
These states seem to heal trauma. They seem to increase their confidence. It really, really increases overall life satisfaction, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially, contemporary psychology comes along and it could care less about psychological possibilities at the upper limits. We're interested in solving pathological problems and that's what we do in the 20th century. We forget William James and we, we take a 100 year detour around these possibilities. And the, the best stat I can give you is over the past 30 years, there have been 46,000 studies on depression. There have been 400 on joy. Wow. So we've ignored the entire upper possibility space, all these experiences. Turns out now, not only has positive psychology started to recognize these experiences, but we've started to look under the hood of them. And we realized that James was totally correct. Under the hood, in terms of the changes to the brain, there's really not a ton of difference between a deep meditative trance, somebody having a mystical, quote unquote mystical experience, somebody in a flow state, somebody having a psychedelic experience. Very similar things are happening in the brain. The right. knobs and levers being tweaked and tuned, tremendous overlap. The other thing that's important, there's a second line of development here at the same time, which has pointed out Maslow noted, it was the first one to notice this. He went, wow, every successful person I've met and who's studying successful people seems to cultivate these non-ordinary states of consciousness to improve performance. What we're finding out now and what Jamie and I bumped into is this massive underground revolution that links all these people who don't think they have anything to do with each other, right? Bio, Dave Asprey, biohackers, soccer moms with yoga practices, businessmen who are using EEG brainwave headsets, people going on meditation retreats, hippies and ravers at Burning Man on psychedelic. Like, no, these people don't even talk to each other. They don't even know they exist, but they're actually doing the same thing. Right. And they're doing it for really good reasons. This is the other thing that we've started to figure out is really the key. A lot of things that are so important in the 21st century, things that are really fundamental from healing psychological trauma, dealing with anxiety, depression, to all kinds of incredible possibilities, skills. You charge to train skills like collaboration, creativity, access to intuition and inspiration. Turns out, we have been trying to train up skills when we what we really need and what the research consistently shows and what everybody from the Navy SEALs to Google to all these people are discovering is we need to be training up a state of mind. So just and, stop for a minute, because that's important. So we, we're, we're trying to train up skills rather than training up a state of mind, so let which me, let would me, naturally take on the skills. Exactly. And let me, let me give a concrete detail. So, you have, so we were lucky enough by we, I mean the Flow Genome Project, to take part in the Red Bull Creativity Project. Tell us about Red that. Bull Creativity Project, it was the largest meta-analysis of creativity ever done. Red Bull not only has athletes on their roster, they also have top creatives, artists, painters, photographers, dancers, whatever. It's in their best interest to make them more creative, right? Like these are their athletes, these are their artists, they gotta help. So they did, they undertook, they've got deep pockets, they undertook the largest meta-analysis of creativity ever done. So they like 35,000 studies, they reviewed hundreds and hundreds of interviews and they came to two overarching conclusions. One, creativity is probably the most important quality today for success in the 21st century, right? It's just critical. And this is not just their finding. IBM did a global study. They found it the number one quality in CEOs. Tw partnership for 21st century says creative problem solving is the most important thing our kids need to thrive 21st century. Second thing the Red Bull Creativity Project discovered, and this is exactly what you, I'm repeating what you just fig figured out, is that we suck at training people to be more creative. We are terrible at it. Yeah. So here's what we now know though. We now know using cognitive technique, using, so let me put a word around this category that we're talking about, these, these are all these non-ordinary states of consciousness that I've lumped together. We, in trying to come, like we didn't want to call them altered states because that's, people just think they're, but we're talking about drug experiences or right. not, right? Like we didn't want to use non-ordinary states of consciousness because it's, well, it's a stupid term, right? So we, it's, it's precise, but it's kind of stupid. So when we were with the Navy SEALs, uh, the commander of SEAL Team 6, which Davis, used a term, he used the Greek term ecstasis. It's actually the root of the word ecstasy. Mm -hmm. And it means an experience where we stand beyond our normal sense of self, so our normal sense of self disappears, and we are filled with intuition, in inspiration, and information we wouldn't normally have access to. And we went, wow, that's perfect. That's a great definition, let's use that. So we're talking about ecstasis or ecstatic experiences, right? So that category. And what we know, flow is a great example, right? So 
one of the things that happens in flow neurobiologically, and this happens in all these states, is you can de the prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that's right back here, deactivates, shuts down, gets quieter. And this is why your sense of self disappears, for example, in flow. This is where that selflessness comes from. Self is calculated all over the prefrontal cortex. Right. And when that network disintegrates, right, you can't create that calculation, your self vanishes, right? We've all had this experience. Mm -hmm. So it turns out when we have this experience in flow, creativity goes through the roof. There was this study in Australia where they took 43 people and they gave them the nine dot problem. So nine dots, you've seen this, connect nine dots with your pencil without four lines up, right? You give this to people, under normal conditions, 5% of the population gets it done in 10 minutes or less. Most of us can't do it, right? right. And it's that experiment, nobody could do it. And then they use transcranial magnetic stimulation to temporarily knock out the prefrontal cortex, induce an artificial flow state that lasted 20 to 40 minutes, and then they regave them the nine dot problem. 43% solved the problem in record time. Wow. That number is works. We've done other work on creativity. Not great. We're starting on a much bigger project, but we've, and that number is commiserable. That's what we see too. There's meditation studies that say as little as four days of meditation training, right? Four one hour sessions, you get a big spike in creativity. There's psychedelic research for microdosing, not even micro full doses, yeah. right? Microdosing, these tiny, can't even feel it. On average, they see a 200% spike in creativity. This is a make, this is two X, 4X, 5, these are big, huge, for a skill that is fundamental, that we can't access any other way, and you're, you're suddenly getting step functions worth of change. This is really revolutionary, and the most important thing, and this is also the other thing that the studies are showing, is that it's not just that creative problem solving, and decision making, things like that go up with these states, it's that they're specifically good for solving wicked problems, right? Wicked problems are those without the easy, either or binary solutions. Right. And they're often problems, you know, as banal as traffic or as complicated as funding to the developing world, where you throw more money, time and resources at them and you create more problems, right? You right. add another lane to the freeway, you get more traffic. Developing money can breed, d development money can breed corruption, yeah. right? These are wicked problems. And we're bad at them and more and more in the 21st century, especially our leaders, the leaders of companies that I talk to, the leaders of the Fortune 100 that I spend time with, this is all they're doing. Right? They're solving wicked yeah. problems all day long. Yeah. And what the study, studies consistently show is not only do these access to the non-ordinary states help us better solve these problems in the moment. This is really cool. This is research that recorded, came out of Harvard. And then uh, Bill Torbert, who's the dean of the business school at Boston College, picked it up. So it turns out that access to these states over time moves you up the adult development scale. You become That's higher up. As you move up the development scale, as you know, you gain what Roger Martin used to call the opposable mind, right? You can see problems from multiple sides. You get more empathetic. You get more ethical. It's the traits we associate with wise. Bill Torbert discovered that the leaders in the top two categories of adult development, not only do they make better ethical decisions and make create more creative decisions, they actually can. He looked. He looked at uh, 500 managers, and he found that those Two people who were in, in the upper development categories, first of all, they had 80% of the management roles. They represent 10% of the broader population, yet they hold 80% of the management roles. Wow. So they have the key jobs, and those in the key jobs were able to engineer total transformations in their companies in the past four years, meaning they massively improved their reputation, shareholder value, bottom line. Amazing. So consciousness, states of consciousness, it turns out, go straight to the bottom line. So you were right where we started, right? You said this is a revolution and it doesn't involve pitchforks. It was a great statement and I totally agree with you. I want to sort of divert for a minute. I'm going to come back, but I want to divert for a minute because I think one of the things that I talk about in my work is change and our resistance to change. And I talk about this in, in one of my key points here is I talk about the distinction between a pivotal moment and a choice point. So pivotal point, choice point. So... The example I give is I fell off a mountain. This was a pivotal moment. And everybody asks, that must be where your life changed. No doubt about it. This is a pivotal moment. And, it, and we've all had them. You know, you've had certainly enough of them. Where you have these moments where you swear, okay, it's got to change. I get it. I got to stop doing this shit, whatever it is. And for some people, you know, it's 
you know, they're in hospital with a heart attack and they're 45 years old and they go, you know, I'm missing my family, I'm missing the kids, whatever it is. Some people, it's a diagnosis of some kind. It's a bankruptcy or it's falling off a mountain, whatever it may be. And there's this moment of pivot, a pivotal moment where they make the decision, I've got to change. It has to change. There's no doubt about it. It's got to change. And then they get a little bit better and it drifts into what I call Monday. It becomes Monday. It normalizes. And that promise becomes a little more distant. And at that point, you challenge the person on it. They might say things like, well, you know, I think I maybe overreacted or I was a bit emotional or I was a bit over or whatever it was. They they pat it down. And, and, and then from there, they drift into back into normal. And in my, opi my opinion, because my fall was not the first, and I know you've had more than one, my big fall was the fourth one uh, that was major before I actually got it. So I went back to another pivotal point. So the cycle is pivotal point, choice point on Monday, and then back to normal and recycle, recycle, recycle. And the, this point over here, this Monday, is the place where you must make the change. And that the change is actually not in the trauma. The trauma is where the catalyst for the change takes place. But the real change actually has to happen when it's been Mondayfied, meaning it's become normalized. There's no real impetus to change anymore. And that that's where the real people who make the shift, the real people who make a magnificent difference do change and it takes them on a different course. It seems, so just to bring this in, into what we're saying here, this pivotal moment is certainly an altered state, but it's not a positive altered state usually. It's usually, you know, it's quite traumatic. Something happened. Here's what I'm wondering, and I'd love to know your input on it. How do we get people to make the pivotal moment into a choice moment rather than monetizing it, monetizing it? How do we get them to make the choice point? Because here it's comfortable. And this is the, the strangulation point. People like you and I have been adrenaline people. People like you and I have been high performance people. We understand that we're looking for that next level. But a lot of people will make the promise here. But as soon as it becomes comfortable, they, they slide. They don't do that. How do we get people to make the choice and change in a, in a, through positive psychology through this way? So I think it's a great question. I think you're like Monday, Mondayizing. I totally understand what you're talking about. You know, this, it, it, it goes into a lot of different directions, right? Sure. One of the things, there are only so many, like, just because of how the way the brain works, right? There's only so many intervention points, right? right. And obviously, motivation is a big one, right? right. And I think, I think there's, there's, there's a, a multiple sides to this coin. I mean, one of the things that we have found about these kinds of peak experiences that we, you know, these ex ecstatic experiences is they're all intrinsically motivating, right? So if you can tie, you know, rituals to it, I mean, for me, writing produces an altered state of consciousness. So what I do for a living produces, you know, a, that the flow experience for me, and it, it's tied to it, right? When I wake up at four o'clock in the morning to start writing, yes, I wanna get stuff done, but what I'm, you know, really hunting is, oh my God, I want that point where I'm gonna forget myself and the words are gonna fly out of me and I'm gonna look back later and go, who the hell did this? Yeah, who wrote right? this is too good. Like, who, yeah. that's, what I, that's, that's what I'm hunting. And the fact that, it, you know, the fact that it shows up that I actually and understand can work and get it a little more frequently now, that's what gets me out of bed. So, I mean, on, on a certain level, I want to, you know, and I think we made this point in, in, in Stealing the Fire, there's a way to kind of, you know, tie these things, harness our own internal intrinsic motivation, right? Mm. And I, you know, I, I, on a totally different side, non, this is the stuff we talk about in Stealing Fire, but... Um, it's stuff that I've been thinking about a lot. You know, I, I think that the high performers, grit's a funny word. You're really, essentially, we're talking about grit, too, right? Yeah. And grit is one of these, Angela Duckworth introduced the term. Psychologists are now saying, hey, wait a minute, it's conscientiousness. There's a big battle over whatever. And, okay, so let's say all that is going on, and the scientists are duking it about, about definitions, and, and I should acknowledge that. In my experience with top performers, and I'm, you know, from business, but also from uh, special operations and also from athletes. I think there are kind of five levels of grit. And I think top performers train all of them. And I think, by the way, 
the grit you're talking about is the one everybody's familiar with. It's perseverance. It's kick me in the teeth, whatever. I'm going to keep going. I'm just going to, I'm going to get up and make a change, right? Or the grit to implement a change is the grit to train your weaknesses, right? And I, which I think is key every year. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually going through this process right now in my own life. I, I, and I do it at the end of every year. I try to identify five to 10 weaknesses in my game, whatever they are, that if I could change this one thing would make a massive 10 X difference in my life. And you know, some of them are small. I'll give you an example of this year's. It turns out that one of the key differences between peak performers and everybody else is how many times you chew your food. I know that sounds crazy, but pe people who have trouble with their weight or people who aren't, who don't have to perform at super high levels will tend to chew their food. They'll inhale. They'll chew yep. their food 10, 10 to 15 times. Peak performers, because it's the way you get all the nutrition from the food, will chew their food 40 to 45 times, right. right? I inhale my food, and yet I run my body at a level that I need the nutrition, right? <laughs> so it sounds like a stupid thing, no, but I'm really training myself to chew my food. That's one example of, right? And there's also stuff in my business game. So you, I think there's a second level of grit, the grit to train a weakness. And... And I think that's that's his key. I think there's the and this is I think equally key is and this is what David Foster Wallace so brilliantly talks about in, in that essay, This is Water, which I think is so beautiful. Yeah, that you have to control your thoughts, right? Hot top performers, they do and if they and if you can't, you put practices in place like respiration, mindfulness, meditation, right? Because it gives you some control over your thoughts. You realize that without that you're sunk. And I think that's part of the pro when you talk about the problems on Monday, right? Like you're talking about a train your weakness problem. You had this relevant, something bad happened. You're like, oh my God, I, this is, I can't keep doing this thing that I'm doing. I got to change, right? In a sense, you're trying to train a, a weakness. I also think some of it is, you know, my friend Scott Barry Kaufman is at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, looked at personality. Is, can you train your, person train your personality? Big five characteristics. Can you change those things? Openness to experience, conscience, whatever. And the answer used to be no, not at all. We're stuck with them. Now the answer is yes, but slowly. Right. Right. And that's the thing we always tell people with the Flow Genome Project. Also, even with Flow, right? You have to go slow to go fast. A lot of times with high performance, for example, let's take Patagonia. I don't know if we talked about this last time, but Patagonia got very interested in putting, getting more flow in the workplace. So. Let's, let's back up and just talk about flow. So McKinsey did a study, talked about this last time we were together, but yep. they found top executives are 500% more productive in flow. Patagonia has a house policy called let my people go surfing. Surfing is a very high flow activity and autonomy, by the way, giving employees autonomy, right, drives intrinsic motivation. It also tends to drive flow. The policy is if the waves are up, Patagonia's headquarters is in Oxnard, the Pacific is right there, they're outdoor athletes, when waves are up, you can quit what you're doing and walk outside and go surfing. Why? Because if spending a couple hours in a non-ordinary state of consciousness is going to bring you back to work and you're going to be 500% more productive, of course I should prioritize the altered state, right? And that's going slow to go fast, right? right. They're giving employees freedom. They're saying, yeah, take a chunk out of your work day, go surfing. Because when you're actually here, you're better. It's also, a, you know... On a super, when, when I work with companies and they want to make their company more flowy, like from an interior design perspective, one of the things I always kind of advise is you got to put in nap rooms. People need to be able to sleep when they're tired. The I am so much more productive. You got to honor sleep for high performance. I'm so much more productive, right? If I've turned this off for 20 minutes and I can come back. All these things, all the things we're looking at in the 21st century, I believe, and it's one of the, I think, the big business lessons in the 21st century is you got to go slow to go fast. A lot of the stuff that we really need in our organizations, you can't go get head on, full steam ahead, boom, the China shop, 20th century. But do, approach, you think, right? do you think that North American business understands that? Because, I mean, I know how busy I am, uh, uh, but, you know, when I look at people, uh, CEOs and such, you know, it's not, we used to talk about it as workaholic. Now it's bragging rights. 
you know, I do 80 hours a week. It's bragging rights. Uh, and and we want everything faster, faster, faster. I mean, and we've got some of the tech to help us with that, but everything is about more demand and faster. And and I totally agree with what you're saying. I've got to go slow to go faster. I'm a person who naps. I believe in naps. I don't sleep a lot at night. I sleep six hours. That's my time. It's perfect for me. Um, but I like at least one 20-minute nap in that day, sometimes two. Sometimes it's actually as little as 12 minutes. I never sleep past 20 minutes. It's 12 to 20 minutes. I wake up, and, and it, it doesn't take me long to come around because I've not slept too deeply. I've gone enough into that gone, and I, I mean, I'm out in 15 seconds, and I'm back. It, within a minute, I'm like, okay, I'm on again. I And I bang up against this. with like, well, we, we can't do that. And so, you know, we, we've got about neuro hacking, brain hacking and all the rest of it. You know, I have my, I have my, my fat coffee in the morning and, and all those kinds of things. And I certainly take the supplements to help my brain, but I also have to recognize the other side, which is if you push hard and I can, I definitely do that. If I push hard and that's all I do, then when do I get the chance to rejuvenate? And I don't, well, that's- I don't think that people get that. Back, by the way, by the way, back to my list of the five levels of grit. One of them is the grit to recover because it is, it's a grit, like it's it, recovery, active recovery. It took me a really, and by the way, whether or not you're using non ordinary states of consciousness, like the faster you go, and non ordinary states of consciousness, they feel like you're going slow, but if you're getting these huge, you're actually going faster. Mm-hmm. You act the grit to recover. It's fundamental. You abs- you're so correct. You absolutely have to do it. When Flow Genome Project, you know, works with companies, one of the first things we do is put everybody on a sleep tracker, right? Yeah. You absolutely have to do it. You can, and you, it's it's grit. Like when I, you know, I do a, a an evening mindfulness meditation. I do not want to do it. I am not interested in it. I have worked 17 hours a day. The last thing I want to do is fold my legs and watch my thoughts and breathe. You know, I'm like, I really don't want to do that. It's, but the reset value right. is phenomenal. <clears throat> and what it, I, what, what am I trading? I'm trading 15 minutes for massively heightened focus, cognitive performance, creativity, less stress. Right. The the performance benefits of those 15 minutes are so high that really I could have taken off work a half an hour early just by you know what I mean like. You can give yourself time back. Yeah, I think that this is one of the greatest lessons for all of us today is the distinction between busyness and being productive. I think there's, you know, one of the other things that I think is just as key here is, and we all, I had to learn this the hard way. I did teach myself. You got to know what a win is, right? You, like I, when I wake up in the morning, my to-do list is eight items long every day. I do eight things every day. Why? And one of them, two of them are really hard writing tasks and they go all the way, you know, down to the smallest ones. But when I've done eight things, that's a win. I get to shut it down, right? Hemingway said there were two rules in writing. He said you have to quit when you're most excited, which I fervently believe and I think this, you know, works for all executives. Stop when you're most excited. Because that way, it's not as hard to come back to in the morning. You're fired up. You've won the motivation. And there's actually, you know, there's a neurobiological reason for it, too. When we're most excited, we're, we've got a lot of kind of norepinephrine and dopamine in our system. Those chemicals don't last very long. Mm-hmm. So they're not going to last very long anyways. So by the time you've noticed it, it, you can walk away. The second thing Hemingway said is when I'm done working, I'm done working. I put it down. Right. And you have to because got a pattern recognition system for a brain it's going to solve creative problems for you but it can only do it if you turn the problem over from the conscious mind to the adaptive unconscious right you can't do it in the conscious mind and you got to you know here's by the way where non-ordinary states really come in handy right because they they do that switch for you but, 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 we, but yeah, it, without it's interesting it, when we talk ball. about non-ordinary states you said you know we think about we might think of psychedelics we might think of meditation we might think of of those kinds of things. But one of the things that I remind people of is one of those states 
it is a state where you are not cognitively working. And they go, what do you mean? I say, listen, I've had some of my most brilliant moments when I'm having a shit. I've had some of my most brilliant moments when I'm having a shower. I've had some of my most brilliant moments when I'm doing the dishes. Where I don't, I'm not consciously, cognitively trying to process. Uh, and where I'm actually drifting and letting myself drift in some way that I'm actually... You know, um, so somebody said to me, well, can you do that with Facebook or Twitter? And I said, as long as you don't read. You can do it as long as you don't read. And they go, what do you mean? Well, every now and then I'll go on Twitter and I just, I'm scrolling. But I don't actually read. I'm actually paying, noticing that I'm not actually reading. And it's, then it'll pop. Because I've got this, it becomes like my background. It's this blur that allows me to drift. And I think that that's an important piece that I think, you know, we make it we make it very difficult to do these things when in fact they're not that difficult that you're actually now, naturally doing them anyway you're totally right and so you're what you're describing right is a well established kind of psychological first of all flow works that way there's a four part if you want to get into flow it's a four part cycle struggle there's a loading phase on the front when you're loading the brain with information right the second phase is release. You have to take your mind off the problem. Certain things work really well. Low grade physical activity. Showers, which you talked about, works really well because so there's something there's a flow trigger known as uh, deep embodiment. Um, and all that means is you're paying attention to multiple sensory streams at once, different input streams. Your skin is your largest organ in your body, right? right. So you're being rained on. It feels it's warm rain, it feels amazing. And it detracts you. There's a release phase. You go through it. And suddenly, your subconscious takes over. And if you look at the, you know, the conscious mind as a problem-solving tool, very powerful, but work really limited. Working memory can hold five to nine items, and most of us tap out around five, right? Adaptive unconscious, it can process an infinite number of items. Right. Literally, like scientists can't find the end of it. It's much faster, et cetera, et cetera. So, of, you know, that's, and it's very quick. All you have to do is, Forget about the problem, and you know, boom comes the solution. There's, you know, we use there's ways to knowing that the brain does that, right? You have a pattern recognition system for a brain. You can engineer exactly what you're talking about. Uh, there's something called the MacGyver method, invented by Lee Slodoff, which right. is a process for driving this, right? Josh Waitskin has a different process. I think it is podcast with Tim Ferriss. I think it is second one. He talks about taking the same kind of process and using it all day long with executives um, in, in really interesting ways. Bring, building those, you know, you got to learn to cultivate the silence on a certain level. I, and, I, and I think that's critical. Non-time is really important. Yeah, it, it, but it, it, you know, here's an interesting thing about, about people. And I love your feedback on it. Some of us are internal processes. Some of us are external processes. Some of us, you know, we like to go away. We think about it, and then we come forward with our with our genius. Others of us think about it. We don't get anywhere until we have a conversation. Until there's some external process goes on, and it's that moment that, exp that explains the genius. So, you know, f for me, because I'm I I I do external, internal, external. So there's an external stimulus. I internally process, and then I externally process out. So for, for me, that, like a conversation like this brings me into my genius. I, the stuff's going on, and I boom, and I can bring it back out. If I try to do that on my own sometimes, it can be difficult for it to come outside in, even with quiet time, even with meditation. So I know that for me, what I would like to do, like if, you know, if I, let's design the ideal. If we're designing the ideal, I'd like to have a shower, which gets me into that space, uh, be instantaneously dried and dressed and ready to go, and then go into a conversation with somebody who's bright like yourself, somebody who gets it, about the subject I'm going to be speaking on stage about. I want to chat to you about it for about 15 minutes, and then immediately we finish the talk, I step onto the stage. I would, I would blow the doors off every single freaking time because I've got that centeredness in my, from the shower. I've got the external stimulus that I've taken in, that now I get to go out again in the world. And I know that that's my cycle, but it's kind of a difficult one to put into action. Any ideas for me, Steve? Well, <laughs> that's super. You know, essentially, 
and there's a lot of different people that have worked on this, your high performers all have triggers, right? Mm -hmm. They, you know, we, we, we know, for example, this is, and it, it's so when I ski, as I'm a big skier, and when I am trying to warm up, what I like to do most is hit little, like going really fast and hitting little jumps, just getting tiny little bits of air, just taste nothing. This is nothing dangerous. I'm essentially like, you know, jog, my version, of, it's creative jogging down a ski slope. Right. right. That feeling centers me more than anything. Like that, centers, I'm trying to figure out what trigger can I build around that so I can do it before I give talks. Sometimes I like, I have little play triggers. Sometimes I, like, I get into my body, I will dance. I will do anything yeah. to get into my body yeah. right before I have to do something in public. Like, I want to remind, because some of what gets triggered in the conversation that you're talking about is the playfulness of banter. It's more fun. You're thinking with somebody else's brain and it's a back and forth. And so some of that, there's a playfulness there. I don't know if you, how you can get to all of it, but you could, I mean, what's happening in the shower is you're feeling your body. So moving your body any which way is going to give you some of that. And then you just have to sort of like, I don't know how you do it. Cause it's, I understand exactly what you're talking about. That's interesting. It's an interesting performance from, I'd have to really think about it. <laughs> well, if you to get it in, so let me it. know. Cause, uh, cause I know I can do pretty, I mean, I'm, I know I'm a great speaker, but I always know I'd like, Damn, if I, like, if, if I could go, I mean, I've had conversations with my wife about the next presentation I'm doing. We're having this combo, and I go, shit, I wish I could walk out on stage right now. Like, I could nail it right now. Nail it. No PowerPoint, no, no, you know, mapping it out. It's like that moment, boom, I'm on because I've got it. That's the place. So it's, it's definitely this, it's an internal, external, internal, external, bam. I don't want to sell anything or buy anything or process anything or process anything that's been bought. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, it's just like, no, don't, 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 don't throw anything else at me. Now I got to get in now. It's like, ah! That's interesting. Yeah. It's so it's, super interesting. It's one I'm still trying to hone down to the, to the fine details. I can go, all right, that's the place where I walk on stage. Because if I, do, if I don't and I get caught in anything, then I become rehearsed and that's so not who I am I be, you know start saying the right word at the right time and the right thing that I wrote down and trying to remember the thing that I wrote down what was that fact as opposed to as you said being in the flow because when I know I mean this is exactly your point when I'm in that flow any stat that I need just like you spit out a bunch of stats you didn't have them written down you you know them well enough that you need something to stimulate them to come forward so there's something that catalyzes that and the, what is that catalyst? And I think that's a really important piece for all of us to work on is what is your catalyst? One of my questions to people is, when are you at your best? And they go, what do you mean? I go, when, when do you walk away going, I nailed it. Like I was so on. When is that moment for you in what you do? So not just, you know, in a sport, but in what you do, if you're a sports person, of course, but in what you do and they go, I don't know. When do you think about that? When do you walk away feeling like, yeah, like I know for me, I, f I, wa I just rock it walking around a conference. I'm at the conference to speak and I don't feel like I do anywhere near as good on the stage and I kill it on stage as I do walking around because there's something about that level of stimulus and the interactions with people and having these really interesting conversations and confronting people's challenges and helping them come up with great answers and helping them do it with insights. I'm just like, yes, that's super dope. <laughs> there's a bunch of interesting things that you just said. One of which there's two different triggers. The one thing you could do try. So on the, let's talk about the first one for a second. Let's talk about stuff. The second one is a novelty, complexity, unpredictability problem. We'll come back to that. We're going to talk about the, how to create the trigger. I don't know if this is going to work, but what I would suggest to you is this conversation is working for you. It's eliciting, if you could go on to stage right now, you would kill it. Yeah. This conversation has a somatic address. It feels a certain way in your body, Absolutely. right? So if you can start cementing that feeling into memory, right? As you go to sleep tonight, visualize this conversation and the feeling right? You, all you want to do is get at the feeling and try to lock that feeling in. See, see if that helps. The novelty can, the other thing is, so 
novelty, complexity, and unpredictability. We talk about them as flow triggers, yeah. right? They grab hold of attention, they drive it. And now what you're saying is, hey, my speech may be a little too rehearsed. I might need, well, you might have to up the consequences. You might have to, you know, try doing some of that a little bit with your speech um, to kind of give you a little more freedom there. Yeah, that is exactly what I do. That, uh, um, you know, I used, to, like, I, I train people to speak. And one of the things I say is I want you to, to learn. I mean, and I, you know, I can't, it never blows, it never ceases to amaze me how many people train people to speak and learn every word. And I go, you know, I think that that's death. I think that's a strangulation of your creativity. I think you should know your material but not know every word and where it goes. Just know right. what it is. And, and, and I, all I say to people is, if you can know more than anything, what do you want them to walk away with? And, and by that, I mean, if it's a strategy, fine, but what is the feeling? What is the feeling? And if you can know the feeling, I want them to walk away with this feeling, and, and I can pair that with a strategy, you can stand up there and fart jingle bells and then deliver whatever it is, they will go away feeling impacted and feeling like you gave them something of value. Tell us what was the turning point for you? You know, I talked about that, that pivotal moment, the choice point. What was the turning point for you? Because you've been, you've been an extreme sports person. And, and this, I, mean, I know you still do a lot of those things. But it seems like from our previous conversation and what I read about you before, it was like you, you're kind of in a different world now. I mean, you work with, you know, like I said, Navy SEALs and, you know, the, the, the military with uh, Google, you know, you're speaking at amazing events. You know, it seems like you, I know you're a journalist, but it seems like it was a shift. Am I imagining that or was it a turning point for you? So, I mean, the interesting thing is I've actually done the same thing from day one in a very weird way. I've just done. So my core question has always been since I was a little kid, what does it take to do the impossible, right? And I have, if you go through my books, I have looked at that from every side. I, what does it take for athletes to perform never before done feats? What does it take for in bold, I looked at entrepreneurs who had built the biggest, fastest, most you know, world changing businesses in the shortest period of time in uh, a small furry prayer, which is my book about kind of animal rescues. I was actually looking at the really, the most extreme version of empathy on the planet is animal rescuers. Because if you say you work with kids, you, you get lots of applause. If you say you work with animals, people are kind of like, huh, what do you, right? It's a little different. So I wanted to know like the most extreme empathy. So that's essentially what I've done. What does it take to really do the impossible over and over and over again? That's, it's been the same question. I've been drilling the same way. I used to be able to point and say, this thing was a turning point or this thing was a turning point. I'm old enough and I'm sure you've had the same experience. It's like when I wrote my, not so much my first book, my second book, I had this experience of, oh my God, I'm the perfect person to write this book and all my life is like, it was built to write this piece of art. I, I, and of course that's true, right? Cause I wrote it and like, but I had that feeling in my second book and my third book and my fourth book, and now I've had it eight times. Yeah. And so I get it. I'm like, oh, this is what it feels like. So I've had lots of, you know, life changing. Well, I mean, I, you know, made tons of money, lost tons of money multiple times. I've been very, very ill. I've broken lots of bones. I've, <laughs> take your pick. Um, I, you know, so now it all like, it all blurs together. If there's one moment that stands out, mm -hmm more than anything that I go back to is there was a moment I, I, I as you, I, we talked about this last time I, I was very sick. I spent three years in bed and as I was getting better, there was a moment when I made the decision that everybody who, you know, kind of brush has a brush with death kind of comes to it where you're like, you know what? I just want to do what I love from this point on, because this can go away. Poof. Anytime. Right. And, I, and I was very, very lucky because at the time I was writing, I was coming over this long illness, but I was writing What West of Jesus, which was essentially, among other things, a book about surfing. So I was at that point, I wasn't getting paid very much money, but I was getting paid to write and do surf. 
So it was a very convenient time to make this decision, right? right. It, made, it was really easy. All I had to do was keep doing what I was doing because it was at that point working. It became more difficult later on. But I really, like that point sticked out, you know, in my head. Because, you know, when you come up as a writer, maybe this is true for everybody. I probably think it is. I don't think there's anything special about me or my way. But there's, a, there's always a, holy shit, I can get paid doing what I love moment. Like you can't actually believe it. And I think this is for, for any creative, right? You get the first challenge for any creative, every creative I've ever met, myself included, um, I'm sure it's true for you, is can I get paid for this, right? Yeah. There's, and you There's think, a certain way, disbelief to it. And when it, right, when it starts happening, I remember I was about 28 years old and I had been always been a bartender and a writer. I was a journalist. I was working my first book and the bar I was working in closed it just shut down and i had the greatest the, I, the owner was a just like it was a great bar it was an amazing experience and i used to be able to take two months off to go report a story and i was like well i'll never get another job like this i think i can actually make enough money off my writing let's try it for a year you know see what happens and i remember just being shocked that i could actually you know i was finally getting paid doing what i love and so the the idea of fully committing to that, leaning completely into that, that was a, that was a very big transformation. I don't, think I, people, think, I don't think people get that, Steve. I mean, you know, um, I remember having a conversation with a, a very good friend of mine, incredibly talented guy, works for the city. You know, it's not, a, does a job that he doesn't particularly like, but he has a wife and a couple of kids and a home and, you know, he's, he's around my age, bought into that world, not, not rightly or wrongly, but bought into that world. And, but he's incredibly creative uh, and he never really touched in on that. I saw it in him, but he didn't see him. And we went over to his uncle's house and his uncle was retired and his uncle was this artist who did carvings and paintings. And I said, wow, you know, your uncle's really talented. He goes, yeah, he's always been like that. And I go, so, you know, what did he do? And he was a mechanic. I was like, oh, that's interesting. So he's only done it, you know, he's always done it on the side, but now he does it. Yeah, but he doesn't get paid. He just loves it. Okay. So my friend was ma masterful uh, metalwork, and mm -hmm. he'd done this thing, and I was like, "That's really cool." And one day I go over to his house, and he's built this um, coat hanger out of wrought iron that he's twisted and done weird things with, and put um, pool balls on, and just it was so cool, right? And it was kind of all weird. And I'm into like I liked a lot of gothic stuff, and it was really gothic looking. And he and I said, "Wow, that with, is pool, with pool balls." With Gothic cool balls, yes, yeah, cool. so it was weird, right? So I was like, yeah. that is so cool. And he's like, yeah. And he goes, I made it for you. And I go, really? And he goes, yeah. I said, that's amazing. How much do I owe you? And he goes, no, 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 no. I, I did it. It's a gift. And I go, what do you mean it's a gift? And he goes, I just had a great time doing it. And I said, that's your freaking problem. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, you have a working class mentality. You have to work in jobs you don't like to get paid but you're not allowed to be paid for the thing you love. I want to pay you for your joy. That's the lesson. But I think that we are so conditioned that you're not allowed to be paid for your joy. You're allowed to pay for your work, and work is a four-letter word. So it's got to be painful, and then you're allowed to be paid. And that's why I still meet writers today who are slogging. And I get there occasionally too, uh, you know, where I'm slugging, I'm like, what the frick am I doing? I'm not in any kind of flow here. I'm forcing myself, and I don't like the piece when it's done. I've, now i got to put it away, and come back to it three weeks later, and now I'm in a flow place, and I rework it, and it's like, it's fabulous. I think that that's part of the problem, is that mentality that we're not allowed to be paid for being in joy, for being in a flow state, for being in that place of pure creativity. But let me... Let me, let me ask you a question, because I, I think you're going to, because I totally agree with you. But the other, the flip side is, have you met any top executive? And I'm not talking about somebody who was there for a quick little bit. Somebody who's been there through the direction, who is not, doesn't have that passion, that joy at the center of what they do, right? I don't think you get to the top. Well, you can get there. It's sort of like you can get accidentally famous. That can happen, but you can't stay there because it's too goddamn hard, right? And I, th and I think this, you can sort of accidentally find yourself at this, in, in the CEO spot, right? If right. you're started a little cool tech startup and suddenly Google, yeah. Amazon, 
Somebody, Insta face, yeah. tweet, right, whatever. They come in and they shower you with cash. And you can suddenly end up in that position. But you can't stay there because it's not sustainable. It's the other, you know, passion. It's, it, I mean, it's fundamental. It's like you have to sort of build your work life around these non-ordinary states of consciousness if you want to achieve what you really want to achieve. And you have to have to start with the passion and the joy. Like, that's the point. Like, if we really want to keep pace in today's hyperspeed world, like everything that people are trying to do, right? Which is, I'm going to slog through it. I'm going to go faster. I'm going to go faster. I'm going to go. No, whoa, whoa. The way you go faster is joy. Yeah. The way you go faster is you incorporate these things. Like that's how you go faster. And you don't, you really don't get it the other way. You cannot slog through this. It's it, nobody's that tough or so few people. I'm certainly not. Right. Um, you're, 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 right. So few people are that tough over time. You, you can't, you can't do it. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. Thank you.